All right, good morning. Maybe let's just open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day you made, and we just ask that you would uh, give us something fresh from your word that we could remember and put into practice today. Lord, we uh, want to hear from you. Lord, I need your anointing, and I ask that you would guide this morning. Amen. Good morning. So I'm going to ask you this question. Is there anyone in your life that you find is always challenging to be around? Or anyone that maybe they mock you or make fun of you or don't appreciate the fact that you're a Christian? Why is that person in your life? What's the reason? And uh, I'm going to look at a couple things here and I think we'll get to it. But I, I think that God wants you to represent him to them. Let's take a look here at a couple passages. I'm going to turn to Matthew 27. This is where I was reading, and I thought it was quite interesting. This is in Matthew 27, verse 11. And it's talking about Jesus, and obviously he was go going through a lot of persecution before he went to the cross from different people, different levels. <clears throat> So verse 11, it says, Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and the elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. I thought that's something. The way he responded in the situation where he's being responded in such a way that those who were there marveled. They thought there's something different in the way Jesus responded, whether that was verbally or not verbally. But his response set him apart from the way others would have gone about things. Most of us, our natural tendency is when people say false things about us or accuse us of different things, we want to defend ourselves really quickly. It happens. The natural tendency is when somebody says something about us that's negative or even if it's true, we often want to say, no, it's not me. Now, when it's not true, all the more we want to say, you got the wrong person. But yet Jesus in this situation, he, he answered once. He said, it, it is as you say, right? I am the king of the Jews. But then he was quiet. They had all kinds of false accusations. Kind of interesting. A little bit later here, down in verse 24, it says, Pilate had gone a few th through a few things with him. And <clears throat> it says here, saw that he could not prevail against the crowd, but rather that a tumult was arising and they wanted to have Barabbas released and not Jesus. So he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. He, the way Jesus conducted himself and the fact that he couldn't find the testimonies lining up that were accurate about Jesus. But he's like, this is a just person. So what he observed in Jesus' life was shining forth this good character, even in the midst of stressful persecution, false things said against him. A little later in verse 27, it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the Praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him when they twisted a crown of thorns they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying hail king of the Jews then they spat on him and they took a reed and struck him on the head and when they had mocked him they took the robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified then verse 45 it says now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran, took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and, out of, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn from two, from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were, 
were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Then verse 54, it says, So when the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. The centurion and those who were with him, probably some of the very same soldiers that were mocking him, crown of thorns, this little reed in his hand, this, this robe they put on him, they're spitting on him. And at the end of it, what did they say? Truly, this was the Son of God. Now we do know that obviously when there was an earthquake and those different things, that oft got their attention. But everything Jesus did up until then was an amazing testimony in how he responded to the mockings, the scourgings, and everything else. How did he respond? Was he cursing back? Was he reviling back? He was quiet, like a lamb before the shears, it says. His testimony and the way he conducted himself convicted them of what? At the end of it all, they said, truly, this was the Son of God. And so I would put forth that we also, when we go through very small persecutions in comparison to what Christ went through, how we respond is really important. And I guess what kind of came to me was, have we ever thought that the very person that is doing this to us is the person that God wants us to represent him to? In other words, this person needs to see Christ in me. I'm not fighting against this person. The devil's using this person to maybe say and do some evil things to me, but I'm not fighting against this person. This person needs to see Christ. And the way you respond, whether it be with a word or without, by your actions, etc., is an opportunity for them to get a glimpse of God. Sometimes they're doing that because they're convicted already. Maybe just simply because you say you're a Christian. Other times made by the way you've conducted yourself. It says Noah condemned the whole world by what he did, it says. And so if we, we, when we walk our daily lives, whether it be at work, in school, in some club or group that we're part of, some people are going to already be a little bit against us because we hopefully represent Christ well. Why? Because part of something within them is hostile toward Jesus. But yet the way we respond to them, even those that are not kind to us, is an opportunity to represent God to them. So I was like, man, that's kind of a whole new way of thinking about things. This is the person that I got to represent Christ to. So rather than seeing them as the enemy, this is be the one that we're, we're wanting to see come to know Jesus, to know the love of God. When you think of it, what was the greatest act of love ever displayed on earth? It was Christ going to the cross. For who? For you and I. When? When we were yet sinners. If that's the way that God loved us, how should we love those who are being mean toward us? Well, they're yet sinning against us. Our every action, word, and thought, intent of our heart, is it love toward them? Are we longing and desiring for them to be able to find repentance and come to know Jesus? That should be our goal. I'm going to turn here to Romans 12, 14. It says, in Romans 12, 14, it says, Bless those who persecute you. Interesting. Bless and do not curse. That's what we're called to do. Verse 17 says, Repay no one evil for evil. Repay no one evil for evil. So if somebody's doing something mean toward you, evil toward you, we need to bless them. Never return it with evil. Look in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. I was pondering, all power I don't know the exact words of the hymn, how does it go? All power goes to Jesus, right? 
And then the angels prostrate, they lie. I say, what kind of God are we singing to this morning? What kind of Jesus are you singing to? Are you singing to a Jesus that is holy, holy, holy? I think sometimes we forget that. We just come and we sing, but we're singing to this holy God who the angels, some of the seraphim, they're covering their eyes, they're covering their feet. They got two other wings that are flying around saying, holy, 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 24-7 for eternity. That is the holy God. And yet, we're not angels. We're his children. We're supposed to be his sons and his daughters. What does that mean to be a son or a daughter of God? You've probably heard this saying, oh, that's, <clears throat> that's your, that you're definitely the son of your father. People said that about me. I knew it was your dad just because I heard his voice. Man, he's got the same bad jokes you got. Right? Same hairline you have. They're like, you're, you're like your dad in many ways. Absolutely. I am. Hopefully only the good ways. Because in the same way, our Heavenly Father is always good. So we want to represent him in everything he does. So, so you shall be, what does it say? Sons of your Father in heaven. We should have the same character and nature of our Heavenly Father. That's what we should have. What does that look like? Loving our enemies. Well, we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, those around us might be saying things that are not kind to us, maybe having some evil intent toward us. Do we love them back? We should, if we're truly born again, if we're sons of our Father in heaven, because that's what he did for us. And now we ought to do the same. Impossible on our own strength. But by the Spirit, we can do the same. It says, for he, verse 45, he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the, sin the, sorry, the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? They're perfect. He's saying you ought to love others just like your heavenly father does. That's what he's calling us to. And so there's a verse here, very familiar. You don't even have to turn there if you don't want, but we know in Romans 8, 28, it says, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. There is a condition. Do you love God? Do we love God with all of our heart? If so, all things that come our way, even if it comes something evil from somebody toward us, somebody's mocking us or persecuting us or doing something not kind to us, it will be worked for our good. If we love God, we do need to love God with all of our heart. I'm going to read another example of this. Look at this, Genesis 37. Verse 12, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. But Joseph, one of the 12 sons, he had dreams that he was going to be used of God. He was going to be great. And his brothers were very envious, and they actually hated him. And they wanted to kill him, it says. But the one brother didn't want him to be killed, so he's convinced them to put him into a pit in the ground, thinking later you could go take him out. But before it happened, some Ishmaelites came through, and they, the Midianites, and they sold him. He sold their brother, and the brother, Joseph, he ended up getting sold from them to Potiphar. And so there he was, and he spent time, he went through many difficult things. But his brothers hated him. Their intent was evil toward him. They wanted to kill him. And yet God was in control, as many of us know. And so if we look here in chapter 45, it says something. And this is when his brothers were so hungry, they came to Egypt. And they'd already gotten some food, and they came back. And it says here, 45 verse 3, Then Joseph said to his brothers, the very one who had every very evil intentions toward him, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Whose lives did that include? 
his brothers, the very ones that hated him and wanted to kill him, out of the 11, I think almost all of them except one, wanted to kill him, he saw he was not bitter toward them. He obviously had forgiven them from his heart because he, didn't, he had no intent, ill intent. He had been able to see that God was behind all of this. God was using this for good. For what purpose? To save life. Now that was a natural life he was saving. He was saving their natural lives by providing food. right? But do you ever see it that way? God, you're allowing these difficult things to happen to me so that I can grow in your character and your nature, so that I can represent you to a lost world who, yeah, they may have evil intentions, but God, you're allowing it. Lord, give me grace that I might represent you well in my response so that they might get a glimpse of who you are. That should be our heart cry. We want to represent Christ to them. Look at chapter 50. It says really simple here, two verses. Chapter 50. Verse 19, it says, Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for, for I am in the for I do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. So you meant it for evil, God used it for good. And that can be true in our lives as well, as it says in Romans 8. That's the promise. So there was a, a man, his name is Richard Warmbrandt, who some of you have heard about probably before. But <clears throat> it was interesting that uh, he was persecuted for years, I think 14 years in a concentration camp in Romania. And he went through extreme torture and darkness for, I think, years. He didn't see light. Anyways, it came about that there was a gentleman that I think... I think he might have been with me when we got to hear him share. We were just in a small group of five or six of us talking, and he was an evangelist, and he was sharing about him. And after he was sharing, I forget what country he was in, there was a gentleman from the crowd who walked up to him, and he said, you know what, I was one of those soldiers who tortured him. But the way he conducted himself, he ended up becoming a Christian. It was years later. That's interesting. So the way that Richard Warbrandt conducted himself in the midst of persecution that none of us have had to go through is exactly what I'm talking about. So if, they, if Jesus could do it, if we see his disciples can do it, one of them being Richard Warbrandt, how much more you and I, considering our persecution is much smaller? Does that make sense? We want to represent Christ to those around us, to those who say mean things, falsely accuse us, whatever it might be, even have ill intent toward us. We want to represent Christ. God has allowed it as actually an opportunity to represent him. Totally different way of viewing it. Because I don't know about you, but I want to get away from all difficult things. But when God ordains it, let's have that different perspective. This is a chance to represent Christ to the very person who maybe Satan's using in an evil way toward me. God's going to use it for good. And I think I'm going to end it off there. But I would like us to maybe have that perspective in our mind. Next time we're going through difficult things, let's represent Christ well.